this is Fergie and you're uh, watching Club uh, Overload uh, .com. Um, I've actually just done my interview and this is the end of it so uh, I think it's going to be put at the start though so figure that out but um, yeah I hope you like uh, my little interview and a lot of things I have to say there's a lot of waffling going on online but I'm worth it because I, you know, I've always said it. I'll be honest, you know, and I always have been honest. The reason why I stopped playing hard house because I didn't like the direction it had gone in. It wasn't enjoyable for me. It it, it, it all became so formulated, and it all became so diluted, you know. Everybody, and it's the same with every type of music, you know. Let's not kid ourselves here. Any type of music that becomes popular more people start to make it, you know. At the time, uh, everybody was still playing vinyl, and uh, all the uh, distribution companies were far out, so all these white labels, and it was all fucking shit. It was all really crap stuff. You know, you had, you had your good producers and your good labels, you know what I mean? It got to the point where I was just playing sort of triple tracks and tidy stuff. Do you know what I mean? So within that, your sets become very steamy, you know what I mean? And I just got fed up with it. It wasn't enjoyable for me. And, you know, people say, uh, you're a traitor and all that sort of stuff back then. I, I understand why they said that, you know what I mean? But from my point of view, is I'm only ever gonna play music where my heart is, you know what I mean? And I'm not gonna go and play music that I'm not enjoying for nothing, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's like, the music, the hard house I was playing, look at it in another way. I was playing all, all over the world doing it. When I stopped playing hard house, my bookings basically stopped a whole lot, you know what I mean? I was playing half the amount of gigs that I was playing. So it wasn't, it wasn't done for a money issue because when I went to play the techno gigs, I was getting paid a third, even less, of what I was getting paid at the hard house gigs. Do you know what I mean? And the gigs I went to play, the techno gigs, it, it took me years to even get them, the gigs, you know what I mean? So it wasn't like I stopped playing hard house and I went and started playing in these techno gigs and stuff, do you know what I mean? It didn't happen like that. It, ha it was basically like starting over again because they thought I was a fucking antichrist. Like, you know, when I started making techno, making music, the, the techno guys wouldn't play it. They weren't, weren't interested. I couldn't even get them to write me a reaction. So, you know, it was a very long process and it was, um, yeah, it took a guts 10 years to build up, do you know what I mean? Um, so I can't see where the old crew would have been a bit disappointed with what I've done, but what other way, you know, I've had this conversation with many people, what other way do you do it? Do you keep doing it and start doing less and less and less gigs and feed it out? Well, that to me, is me taking money off promoters and, and playing the clubbers and, and doing something with my heart's not in. So that's worse, you know? So, you know, I, I took the stick, plenty of the fucking stick. If I'm being honest, I didn't know how it would go down when I decided to do these gigs. I thought, mm, you know, I wonder what the reaction will be. But, you know, the reaction's been brilliant. And I think that at the time, people were just, People were, I think people were just a bit shocked. I don't know anybody else that had done it, you know what I mean? It literally stopped playing the style of music that they were known for to try something else. You know, some people say it was stupid, some people say it was brave, some people say, you know, whatever. You've just got to do as a DJ what you feel. And that's what I say to the, the new guys coming through and that, new producers. You know, you've got to do what excites you because if you're not exciting and you don't, you don't seem exciting, and you're not excited by what you do. Who wants to know that? You know, anybody. You know, let's face it. You know, you're, you're nobody's fucking. You know, everybody's sort of playing more or less the same sort of tracks. You know, so you've got to inject a little bit of yourself in there. And Fuck. <laughs> There's 
so many for different reasons. You know, I know that's very cliche, but you know, there's my first Radio One gig. It was a massive thing for me and for my family. Do you know what I mean? There's the first time I, I played in the UK, and Tony brought me over. It was the first time I played in Trade. It was massive. Uh, the first time I played at the Berlin Love Parade. I mean, these are all gigs that are all so different, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I mean, fuck. If I had to pick one, the one that sticks out in my head the most would be the first time I ever played Trade in, in the Test Lounge. And that was what Trade put on once a year. And they give new DJs a little chance to play in the Test Lounge. I mean, let's just try and put this into perspective. When Tony first played Trade, he was sick. I mean, you know, everybody wanted to play Trade. Back then, it was the same DJs every week. Do you know what I mean? He didn't get to play Trade. So, for me to get to play in the Test Lounge, it was a massive thing. And not only that, Tony came in to see me, Steve Thomas, uh, Malcolm Duffy was there, Lawrence Malice, who owned Trade, and Rod Lay. You know, they were all there to see me, like, I was absolutely shitting myself. I was 17, 17 years old, like, in a fucking raging queer club, like, which was just amazing. It was like nothing else I'd ever seen in my life. And I've still not seen anything like it. But, you know, it was my turn to play next. I'm like, fucking shaking. I mean, I got, I got to the club sort of 12 hours before I was meant to play. Just hanging about, waiting there, you know, I was seeing the club. People coming into the club, you know, them getting changed into their fucking shorts and all the gay stuff that they used to wear. So I seen the atmosphere brewing, you know what I mean, and it all building up. And uh, I just started flipping, you know, getting worse, really nervous. But anyway, when the moment came, I was all right. But I remember putting the first record on and the needle just kept jumping on me. And it was a fucking nightmare. I remember fucking looking over the corner of my eye and seeing Tony and everybody over there and they're just, you know, talking, you know, wondering what's going on. And this big transvestite came over, like, took the needle off the fucking record, got a bit of tune going, like, stuck it on the, the edge of the cartridge and put the needle back down and that was it. Just didn't jump at all. The atmosphere was burning because everybody could see. I mean, it was only a small room, so everybody could see what was going on, you know. So when that happened, it was like, Phew. yeah, it was amazing. So that that you know, you talk about big gigs. That was probably the smallest gig in terms of people there. You know, a couple of hundred people in the back room of terminals. Um, but probably the biggest gig in terms of. Um, putting me on the sort not on the map, I don't mean it like that. I mean introducing me to that scene, because that was Tony's thing, you know what I mean? And for him to stand up and say, you know, put this guy on like was a big thing, you know. Yeah, really good. Uh I really enjoyed myself. Um but you know what? It's hard keeping up with uh the hard house sound that is today, or whatever it's called. Um, for me personally, um, uh, yeah, the hard house I would kind of play, you know, would probably start about 137, go up to, you know, 140. So for, for me and the sound that I would play, you know, you're really pushing it. Um, play at these events because the, the hard house sounds moved on so much from when I was doing it, you know, it was like 10 years ago. But, you know, people people still remember the tracks and people still have memories attached to them. So, you know, it's been special for me to come and be able to do it and obviously I have a lot of memories attached to the, the music as well. So, yeah, we have to speed it up quite a lot, but, you know, everything's sort of still intact and uh, the message is still being put across. So, um, yeah, I did speed up as much as I could. I think I got the 150 on the last track. Um, yeah, crazy, man.
crazy, but really good to be able to play it. And as I say, you know, we decided this year how uh, we were going to take a few uh, old style gigs on. They're not all hard house. Uh, I played at the Arches last week, and it was um, more of what I was doing when I when I stopped playing hard house. It was more uh, more on the sort of Italian sort of techno, sort of BXR sort of route. But um, I was actually surprised how many people came and asked me to play some of the old trade stuff. You know, so I had to uh, throw a few E and M numbers in there and a few. Tony Davies and Steve Thomas tracks. So yeah. Um, I mean, it was always meant to be uh, a few gigs, you know. It was always meant to be f a few gigs, um, for my own enjoyment. <laughs> because you know, although I moved away from my hard house all them years ago, um, you know, it was it's always been. You know, the music that I would play from back then has always been a massive inspiration to me. And it's been a massive part of my progression as a DJ. You know, when I'm in the gym or I'm, you know, or I'm traveling, I've got my iPod on, I'm listening, you know, to them old mixes. You know, there's still, and always have been a very big part of um, what I've done in the studio the last sort of 10 years. I think you can hear that in the music. You know, um, what did you say? <laughs> no, what is your good? I do some waffle and like, don't edit that out. Right? Um, no, you know, I'm going to continue doing the gigs. Um, you know, as I say, I started doing them as a sort of selfish thing for myself, but you know, they've been really well received. And um, yeah, you know, I, I'll keep on, I'll do a few more next year. You know, we're going to be doing Summit Storm. Uh, with the legend that is Jimmy Dean, yeah. Um, so we're going to be doing a few down there, which is, you know, obviously good because it was um, my night that started. So it's good to see it still going. Must be one of the longest running nights, eh? No, not future. I mean, I, I, I was I was doing it a good few years ago. I mean, for me, I like to try anything. Um, about four years ago I started using Serato um, then I progressed on to Tractor Tractor Scratch then on to uh, Tractor where I was using the MIDI controllers about three years uh, I used the stuff and um, it's very good you know what, what it allows you to do is phenomenal um, for me the purpose of it I kept sort of defeating the whole sort of the purpose really you know I started taking more stuff with me you know it's meant to stop taking CDs but you're taking your CDs in case your laptop doesn't you know doesn't work you know you're taking your leads you're taking extra leads in case your fucking leads don't work you're taking controllers you're taking batteries for your controllers you know you, you're taking more than you would take if you're just using CDs so you know, that was one of the reasons. The last time I actually used Tractor was when I played at uh, was it Sundance Festival, something like that in Poland. And um, it was a big, massive stage production, blah, blah, blah. And they said to me, you know, you're not allowed on stage until uh, the DJ that's on before you's finished and you've got three minutes. We're going to play an introduction, welcome, Fergie, and all this bollocks. Which was all very good, you know, it's all very theatrical and stuff, and really hyping it up. But, you know, I said to the stage manner, you know, listen, uh, it's going to take me longer than that to set up two controllers and my laptop and get everything plugged in and be ready to go, you know. They wouldn't hear of it now. Anyway, they played this fucking introduction three times, man. It's like, welcome, live on stage, welcome. Uh, wasn't very fucking live on stage man. I couldn't my laptop wouldn't turn on now. Just would not come on. So I ended up playing CDs. And after that, you know, I just said bollocks. 